Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I have several announcements. Looks like we're having a little trouble with the projection this morning. So I'll, I'll go slowly so you can <laughs> take it all in. This coming Saturday at 2 p.m., there's going to be a flute concert at, here at the church. There's going to be uh, um, some extras, uh, a hot chocolate bar. Um, it's going to be fun. It's going to be family friendly. So uh, come to that again Saturday at 2 p.m. Next Sunday, after worship, there's going to be a meal assembly or meal kit assembly at 10 a.m. right after church for CAS community services. So stay after church for that to get those done. Christmas Eve services. Uh, 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve will be our will be an informal service and will feature our chancel choir and a special time to participate in the Christmas story. And then at 7 p.m., we'll have a more traditional service with uh, professional guest musicians playing harp and flute. And there'll be a candle lighting at both services. And you may have noticed a card like this as you came in on the back table. It has those details about the times of our Christmas Eve service. Now, I know that you know when to come, but if you take four or five of these, you can invite people to come. And so that's an important part of of our our witness is inviting people into the life of the church and inviting people to hear the story on christmas morning which is a sunday this year we will still have church It'll be, it's a, it's a remember the reason for the season it's going to be informal you can wear your new christmas pjs if you want we'll sing lots of christmas carols and we'll have a special gift for each family that comes just a reminder up front, we have the Christmas, the giving tree, where we're collecting socks and mittens and gloves and uh, men's underwear. Yeah. <laughs> and we have several points set up, up front, you, you, you noticed. Only about five of those have been claimed. Uh, if you're interested in uh, purchasing one, um, you can do that. Uh, they were purchased early so that we could have them here for Advent by candlelight. And some are designated already, but we'll hope you'll want to honor or memorialize some special people in your, people in your life by purchasing one. There's order forms by the church office. And we want to thank everyone who worked and came to the Advent by candlelight. It was a beautiful event. It was an amazing event. It was the first time I've experienced it, of course. It was very successful. Uh, to, to this moment, we've raised $13,117. Wow. Yeah. And the, the giving portal online is still open for another two weeks, so um, people still have an opportunity to give. Uh, I'll turn it over to Bob for our call to worship. Our screen is back. God is great. <laughs> Please join, at least stand and join in our call to worship, our responsive reading. God is a safe place to hide, ready to help us when we need him. Jacob wrestling, God fights for us. God of angel armies protects us. Attention all. See the marvels of God. He plants flowers and trees all over the earth. Bands war from pole to pole. Breaks weapons across his knee. Step out of the traffic. Take a long, loving look at our God above everything. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And now please remain standing and join in singing our opening hymn, Be Still My Soul, at number 534 in our hymnals.
They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy communion, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. We are the followers of that root of Jesse Isaiah spoke of. We are the ones who are now called to stand as a signal to the world, to all of creation, that peace is the will of the one who created us. Peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near and bear fruit worthy of repentance. We light these candles, the candle of joyful hope and the candle of proclaimed peace, in part to remind ourselves that we are a people rising toward God's promise, but we also light them as a sign to the world, an announcement, there are some who hold on to hope and there are some who work the ways of peace. We stand as a sign that Emmanuel is still our fervent prayer. I invite Althea Simpson to come forward for the children's message. Christmas and Advent. So Advent means coming. And our theme this year is, who knows? Oh, that's right, you guys weren't here last Sunday. <laughs> Prepare. So we're getting ready. That's what we do at Advent. So when I was a girl and now, I belong to a church where we had something called Church Mothers. Well, I have church mothers at Franklin, but at my home church, we did. And church mothers would sit on the front row every Sunday, and they would help guide us in how we should act in church and how we should act in life. That was their role. But my favorite thing about church mothers was this. They always had Christmas in their purses. Now, our parents didn't necessarily know because church mothers would tell us to do something and then, you know, sneak us a little Christmas in our hands. So that's how we got along. So we're going to sneak a little Christmas in your hands today, reminiscent of when I was growing up. So, yeah, you can eat them. <laughs> It's not fake Christmas in your hands. Let me grab you on, Jalen. So, anybody know why this is Christmas in your hands? Yeah, Josie? Because <laughs> you eat and craft a candy on Christmas. Not quite. But what does that peppermint in your hand remind you of? It reminds us of candy. It is candy. But it looks red. It's red and white. Like this. Like candy canes. How many of you put candy canes on your tree? 
How many of you? How many of you know why we put candy canes on our tree? No, not for Santa. Yeah. Josie, what is this a symbol of? Why are these on trees and where do they come from? So there's lots of legends about why we have these candy canes on our trees. And one of them that I'm going to tell you now is probably the most prominent one. In 1670, and I couldn't remember which church it was, but it was the Cologne Cathedral in Germany. The choir master had the candy maker make some sugar sticks to keep the kids quiet while they were performing the living crash. So the living crash is the living nativity. You know, remember we used to do like a little pageant where we dress you guys up in those kooky costumes and stand you up here. You guys remember when you did that? Okay, so they were doing one of those and the kids were kind of noisy. So he said he wanted to have it part of the crash so that it made sense. So he had it bent at the top so it would look like a shepherd's crook. It looks like a staff. So that's why the candy cane looks like it does. And it was in the 1800s when they used to hang a lot of food on trees. In Germany again, how many of us have German descent? Okay, find me one day and I'll tell you some of the amazing Christmas and Advent traditions that come out of Germany. Most of them actually that we have, that we observe in churches especially Protestant ones, come from Germany. So they used to hang this because it was just one of the treats that went on the tree. And so since the mid-1800s, we've had these on our trees, but they symbolize so much about our faith story. And there's another story about why it's red and white. So we'll talk about that one downstairs, and then you can share with your parents and grandparents. But that's why the mothers of my church <clears throat> had Christmas in their purses, and I loved it. So thank God for these symbols of faith. Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God we thank you, we thank you for, mothers for mothers and others, and others. Who, remind us who remind us of your love your mercy, your mercy, and your great gift. And your great gift. Help, us Help us to tell others, to tell others. The, story the story of your gift, of gift. And, your love. and your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So our hymn of meditation, which is that coming up next? Yes. Is uh, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, but instead of singing it, our bell choir, well, bell ensemble is going to play it. So let's prepare our hearts for prayer as we listen to this lovely arrangement done by our own Lily Malley of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
Please join me in prayer. Father, thank you for the light of a new day and the promise of new opportunities to serve you. We cherish these times together to sing songs of praise and lift our voices in prayers of thanksgiving to you. We've just completed our November series on women in the Bible as we studied and learned inspirational stories of women who faithfully served you, changing themselves and their communities in mighty ways that served your kingdom. Perhaps in part inspired by these women, the women of this church, as they have for decades, celebrated the beginning of Advent with an incredible service of light led by Reverend Faith Fowler and Dr. Althea Simpson. Our women yet again broke their fundraising record for Cass Community Social Services. We thank you for all who served so faithfully in your name and yearn to find ways to make this and other events even bigger and even better so that this church can better shine a beacon of faith on the grace and glory you've shared with us. Our spirits are also list, lifted this morning by, the, by today marking the second Sunday of Advent. As we prepare to celebrate you coming to live among us through your son, we pause to reflect on the magnitude of an event that occurred more than two millennia ago and how it affects us still today. An event that transcended, that transcended gender, race, nationality, social status, and all other classifications that we too often dwell upon and that separate us, not only from each other, but also from you. The child of Bethlehem came to lead us, to unite us, and to transcend us. Let us use this Advent season to answer Jesus' call in everything we do, in a world where violence Acts of war and other unthinkable examples of inhumanity are all too common. Inspire us to throw ourselves at these acts and any other pain or need that we encounter so that we may be your hands and feet to heal those who suffer illness, to relieve poverty, to feed the hungry, and to diminish all forms of suffering by sharing your good news and healing touch. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Now I invite you to continue in silent prayer, lifting the names and concerns listed in our bulletin as well as those that are personal to you. Now, as we conclude these moments of prayer, let us lift our voices in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we have the opportunity to give back, to offer God our gifts, tithes, and offerings. So as the, the, the ushers come forward, um, be in prayer, uh, be in meditation, and know that, that God is with us. Will the ushers come forward?
Gracious God, as we offer these gifts back to you, we ask that you would take them and bless them and multiply them so that we can do your work, so that we can be your hands and your feet in this broken world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, choir. I now ask that you stand, and as you are able, and to join, and join in reading in unison our prayer for illumination. Lord, help us to understand your word, for your word is true. Help us to be faithful disciples as we do what your word says. May your word lead us to unspeakable joy, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. And for this morning's scripture lesson, I ask you to continue standing, and uh, uh, I'll give you a little background since we are continuing a story here. Our scripture today continues the birth story of John the Baptist. For those of you who were not here last Sunday, this is where we are in the story. There was an older couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, who were very righteous. But even though they had often prayed for children, they had no children. They both belonged to the priestly tribe of Aaron, which meant that, which meant that Zechariah, Zechariah would take his turn going to the temple to do the priestly duties of offering incense. One time when he was offering incense, an angel appeared to him 
and told him that he and his wife were going to conceive a child and they should name him John. So now let us continue the story by reading Luke chapter 1 verses 18 through 20 which is the conversation between Zechariah and Gabriel. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I know that this will happen? For I am too old, for I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. We continue our story now at verse 57 to hear the story of John's birth, which is the scripture found in your bulletin. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, none of your relatives has this name. They then began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue freed, and he began to speak, praising God. And now we skip a few verses to hear parts of Zechariah's prophecy. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go, you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will, be, will break upon us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the scripture. So this is Advent, and our theme is prepare. Last week we talked about preparing through prayer. Today I want to talk about preparing with trust. As many of you know, the, my life before becoming a pastor, my wife and I ran a restaurant. And we were both working, to say we were working full time was an understatement. We, if you've ever known a restaurant owner, it's, uh, it's more than full time. It's very, very busy. It was difficult work. And then I got called into the ministry. And so I went, and I was a full-time student. Well, about that time, the, the town, the small town where we were living, decided to uh, do a streetscape right in front of our business. So that meant we had no business, no traffic in front of our business. That, that diminished our ability to uh, operate. And shortly after that, the... Um, the Frigidaire Corporation, which was, if I were to say it's the biggest employer um, in, in the town of Greenville, is also an understatement. It's, um, it was basically the only employer, you know, because it was so huge, they moved operations to Mexico that year. And so I was a full-time student, streetscape, lost a lot of business. Basically, a local economic collapse happened. And so to say that my wife and I were experiencing some hard times financially, is a true statement. And I was going to, full, going to school full time, so I went to my pastor and I said, you know what, this whole thing I talked to you about, about becoming a pastor, I just don't think it's going to work. I got I to gotta go back to work. And he just looked at me. He said, when did God let you down? He wasn't saying God was letting me down. He didn't say, he didn't give me any kind of prosperity gospel nonsense. He didn't say that God was going to give me some money or anything. He just asked me a simple question. When, when did God let you down? And I was thinking that, well, God never did let me down. And so it became a, an exercise of trust. If God really wanted me to do this, he would have to work out. And it got a lot worse before it got better. 
but it got better. Trust in God is part of what it means to prepare for the coming of the Lord. To pre- prepare for Christmas, yes, but to prepare for the change that will happen in your own life. You have to trust God. It's a necessary part of the faith journey. It, trusting God means that we, tr- we make the, the choice to trust him. Now, trust doesn't ignore the questions that we have. We have questions and we have doubts. And questions are good. Questions prompt us to explore further. We're meant, we're designed to ask questions. We're intelligent creatures. But when we have faith, our doubts and our questions lead to a deeper faith. Now, doubt is a normal part of spiritual life. Martin Luther once said, only God and certain madmen have no doubts. <laughs> perhaps you, you do have faith, but perhaps God has felt distant to you, maybe lately or maybe at some point in your life. Or perhaps maybe you just wish that God's voice was clearer and louder in your life, that you could just know exactly what you're supposed to do at any given time. Let me ask you this. Have you ever considered that there might be a connection between the amount of noise, audible, you know, just the things we hear, visual, you know, the things that we see, that the, the billboards, the, the ads on, on, online, on TV, wherever, emotional noise, people asking, demanding so much of you. See that connection between all that noise in your life and your ability to hear God. In the scripture reading for today, we pick up where we left off last week. We get Zechariah's response to Gabriel's announcement that he will become a father in his advanced years. And Zechariah asks, "How you know you say this, Gabriel? But how can I be sure of this?" And I'll summarize Gabriel's response by saying, because I'm Gabriel and God said so. Of course, there's no way for Zechariah to be sure outside of simply believing what the archangel was telling him. There was no concrete evidence. There was no proof. There was no written contract. It was just an angel saying this is going to happen. And Zechariah had questions. But it's an angel of God. Come on, Zechariah, you're a priest in the temple. You've been training for this moment. But Zechariah was like, meh. So Gabriel responded further, because you don't believe or trust, you will remain silent, unable to speak until these things happen. Now, this might seem like a punishment. And it very well could have. I mean, have you ever noticed preachers like to preach? They, you know, take away that and we're a little lost if we don't get to say things. But I think there's something a little deeper going on here. I think it's likely that God was helping Zechariah grow spiritually through this this circumstance. To grow through this season of silence. Essentially, the prescription for Zechariah's spiritual health was written by Gabriel. And it was, talk less and listen more. Now, just as Jesus calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee when he was on a boat with his disciples, God, through Gabriel, was calming the mistrust of Zechariah with silence. I contend that Zechariah's silence was actually more of a gift from God. Where his trust was lacking, silence gave him room to see what God was up to. Silence and solitude is a are powerful disciplines. And these were a regular part of Jesus' ministry as he lived and operated in his earthly life. Scripture often records Jesus going off by himself to pray. In fact, silence is an appropriate response to the awe and mystery of God, and we see it all throughout Scripture. 
In Deuteronomy 27.9, it says, Moses spoke to all Israel, saying, Keep silence and hear, O Israel, this very day you have become the people of the Lord your God. Then in Psalm 4, it says, When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it in your beds and be silent. Then in the prophet Habakkuk 2.20, it says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Then in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus invites us, Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. It's not explicitly about being silent, but true rest feels like it would be silent because all that noise falls away. The visual the emotional, all that. And it's just peaceful. And it's holy. So perhaps God was slowing Zechariah down to listen and to learn to trust. This was a, a big event, this pregnancy in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life. It was going to change everything. And God was saying, I know, I know. Just take a deep breath. Listen. Remember who I am. I have not forgotten you. And it worked. Time spent in silence gave Zechariah the time to understand what his son's mission would be. Zechariah said, You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord and prepare his way. You will tell his people how to be saved through the forgiveness of their sins, because of our God's deep compassion. The dawn of heaven will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide us on the path of peace. Zechariah got it. It took those months of being silent, but he got it. He got himself in alignment with God's purpose and it prepared him to trust. Now, we all have questions. And we don't have all the answers. Making the decision to trust absent those answers is called faith. That is sometimes a difficult step to take. If you have trouble trusting without having all the answers, perhaps you need the same prescription. Perhaps you need to slow down. Perhaps you need to take time to listen in silence. Pay attention to what God is doing all around you. Do you take enough time for silence in your life? God can be found in the sound of sheer silence. Does your schedule, your time, your life look like that of a person who wants to hear the voice of God or is it filled with busyness and noise? I want you to think about this. Add up the time that you've spent worrying and talking about your difficult situation and worrying more and complaining. And what's the total time you spent fretting about things? Now spend that same amount of time in silence, listening for what God might have to say, and then learn to trust him. We may crave certainty, but instead God gives us mystery. And he invites us to trust God. Faith in God is a, is a decision that we make. We choose to believe. We choose to follow Christ. We choose to allow ourselves enough time and space to listen for God's assurance, to make room in our lives to see what God is up to. Jesus never asks us to set aside our doubts or our uncertainties or questions. Jesus simply says, come and follow me. It's an invitation to trust him without having to be sure. No certainty is required to make that step of faith. Just trust. Now, like I said earlier, the, with my situation and the economic downturn and the restaurant, 
it, it got a lot worse before it got better. And I didn't know, I, I thought the, 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 the ground was slipping out below me the whole time, and I just kept on saying, God, I know you're in this. God, I know you're in this. And he has been. And, and I, because I've been through that, I can trust God even more. We, we can, we can, when we trust God in little things, God will prove himself in big ways. As we prepare for Jesus through these weeks of Advent, the age-old invitation comes to us each, again, to each of us. We're invited to put our trust in the God who came to us in Jesus as a baby in Bethlehem. May you, with all of your wonderful questions and doubts, come to trust that God loves you. Would you pray with me? Lord, help us to trust you, even when we're not sure. Help us to find moments of silence to listen for your voice. Help us to walk in the light of your love. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's time for Holy Communion. And... This is one of the means of grace. One of the ways that God shows us that he loves us, that we can experience his love in a tangible way. You need not be a member of this church or of any church to participate in this. This is God's gift for all of God's people. The way we typically do this is you approach by the center aisle, receive a piece of the bread, dip it into the juice, Eat it. You can kneel at the front if you wish, or you can return by the side aisle and be in prayer in your pew. And we spend time in silence, in prayer, trusting that God is with us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. You looked for, who looked for that day when justice would roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation would not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so, with all of your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things, and the rich you send empty away. Your own son, you came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. Gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup 
And he gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body of, and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty God, now and forever. Amen.
Would you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for this holy mystery in which you invite us to trust you that through the receiving of the bread and the juice that your love is in that and that as we take it, you bless us, you reassure us, you continue to forgive us, and Lord God, we pray that you make us better than we've ever been before. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand and sing with me. Leave it there, number 522 in your hymnal or project it on the screen. Just a reminder, uh, I'll let you know that there is donuts and coffee down in Searles Hall, so come on down and, and join some fellowship. And don't forget to grab a few cards to invite people that would, would enjoy coming to a Christmas Eve service. Now as we go from this place, let's go trusting the Lord, trusting that, that he has it all worked out. Go in peace and may the God of peace be with you all. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you.